14 little kids and a teacher killed today at their elementary school in Texas. President Biden is expected to address the nation in 15 minutes. We will bring you that here. First, though, we're going to talk about what happened, why America alone has this many mass shootings, and how we keep being told that nothing can be done about it. Before killing more than a dozen children at an elementary school in Uvalde, Texas, CNN says the killer shot his own grandmother, who at least initially survived. NBC reports that some parents are still just now being told whether their child survived. This is the deadliest shooting at an American elementary school since the attack at Sandy Hook in Connecticut in 2012. Texas's Republican governor, Greg Abbott, said something that sounded familiar today, suggesting that these mass killings of innocent Americans cannot be explained. He shot and killed horrifically, incomprehensibly, uh, 14 students uh, and killed a teacher. The idea that it is beyond comprehension or unimaginable ignores that we can Im imagine children being slaughtered by someone with a gun. We can comprehend it happening in the United States because we have seen it happen before. Political leaders can feign ignorance or surprise, but there's no need for the rest of us to play along because we know better. Colorado, in particular, knows better. The NRA convention is coming up in Texas later this week. I'm guessing they'll go ahead with it because the NRA held its convention in Denver in 1999, just 10 days after the Columbine school shooting a few miles away. That's why Governor Abbott's words sounded so familiar today about how it's incomprehensible that this could happen. The NRA said the same thing in Colorado 23 years ago. When an isolated, terrible event occurs, our phones ring, demanding that the NRA explain the inexplicable. The governor of Texas today and the head of the NRA then may seem befuddled about why America has such a high rate of mass shootings, but thankfully, we do not need to rely on them for an explanation because we have scientific research. Even today, grief and clarity can coexist. So I'll just say it. It's the guns. It's the widespread availability and unsafe storage of 42% of the world's guns. Coloradans have a wide range of views on gun policy, but we can't have an honest conversation about why kids keep dying until we move past two things. First, the instinct to say we can't believe it happened again. Of course it happened again. A 2015 University of Alabama study found that the U.S. has 4% of the world's population and 31% of the mass shooters. This is America. This is what happens here. And this is what will keep happening here until something changes. Next, we have to push past the distractions, the other explanations for why kids are being killed with guns, mental health, video games, the stuff that sometimes is earnestly offered by people who just haven't read the research, but sometimes is thrown out as a stumbling block by people who don't want to talk about guns, even as kids wearing backpacks are put in body bags. We can talk about mental illness, but not as a distraction to avoid talking about guns. Because research shows that American rates of mental illness are in line with other countries with far fewer shootings, and the vast majority of people with serious mental illnesses are never violent. Using video games as a distraction from talking about guns is even flimsier. Look at the countries with more gaming. Japan, South Korea, the Netherlands, they're not awash in mass shootings. Colorado may be in a unique position to have the honest conversation that is finally needed because Colorado knows the pain of loss from mass shootings because we also know the role that responsible gun ownership and use have in society because we know that most of our gun deaths are suicides because we know that background checks, Red flag law, safe storage law, they have not led to abuse or widespread infringement on liberties in Colorado. 
But that conversation can only happen when we cut through the BS and the politicians pretending that they're confused and shocked by today's shooting and tackle why the U.S. is different in such a terrible way. It's the guns. There's a Coloradan headed to the White House tomorrow to tell the president about her son. Shanine McLean will be there as President Biden signs a federal law requiring police officers intervene if they see another officer using excessive force. McLean's son Elijah was stopped by Aurora police in 2019. He had done nothing wrong that night. He was taken to the ground by officers, put in a carotid hold, and paramedics injected him with ketamine. He died days later. The president signing the police reform bill tomorrow, two years to the day after George Floyd was murdered by police in Minnesota. There are people in Denver who open up their mailboxes nearly every day and find offers from investors to buy their homes unsolicited. It's led one community coalition to start buying up land itself to make sure that people don't get priced out of their own neighborhood. Here's Mark Salinger. The sound of change comes in the form of yet another construction crew working outside Alfonso Espino's home. It's changing right before our eyes. Alfonso has lived in the Illyria neighborhood in North Denver his whole life. Yeah. Now he's a community organizer with the Globeville Illyria Swansea Coalition. Everybody has a pound worth of a mailers offering cash for your home. He gets offers from developers all the time to buy up his family's home so investors can replace it with something new and more expensive. The neighborhood coalition is fighting back, buying up land in the area through a trust called Tierra Colectiva, or collective land. Neighbors will choose what to do with the land instead of developers. Our land trust is specifically focused on preventing displacement. It's anti-displacement effort, and it's not anti-development. It's about developing for those who need it most. And that diversity, that kind of integrity, that, that sense of belonging and, and rootedness that's always been uh, a pride of Denver is really is really going away. Jeremy Namath is a professor of urban and regional planning at CU Denver, focusing on topics like gentrification. He says everyone deserves to see their communities built up without the fear that people will be driven away from their homes. One of the main issues that that I really fear as an urban planner is that some residents, particularly low income residents of color, are, are fighting against the development that is uh, that's coming into their neighborhood because that development is seen as not benefiting them. Change doesn't have to be bad. Change is only scary when we can't have a part to play. Alfonso fights to keep his community away from the change that's pushing so many people away from their homes. Change is only scary when it doesn't benefit us. More than half of people who live in Denver rent their homes or apartments. Those are the first people to be impacted by these absolutely insane housing prices. We're seeing all it takes is one landlord to raise rent and then people are yeah. automatically priced out literally for hundreds of dollars that we're seeing right now that rent's going up each month. So they've got an idea, they've got a strategy. At the end of the day though, they're going up against developers with deep pockets. And all of this comes down to money, right? They're asking for more grant money from places like the city. They don't know if they're gonna get that, but sometimes Alfonso said that it can feel like an uphill battle when you're going up against somebody with millions of dollars wanting to buy a property. Yeah, interesting. Let's keep track of their approach. Absolutely. All right, Mark, thank you. If a tree falls from government property onto your property, is that your problem? It's not an uncommon question after last week's snowstorm and all the damage. Our Marshall Zellinger found the answer depends on which city or county is involved. It's sitting on my, on my daughter's play school playground right now. The thing's the size of a rhinoceros probably weight wise, so I haven't really been able to, <laughs> to investigate underneath. It used to be a tree. Todd Hockmuth is in a seemingly rare situation where his city, Arvada, is responsible for removing this downed tree and perhaps any repairs. It's located behind uh, a fenced area that um, I believe is operated by the city. The limbs that may or may not be the weight of a rhinoceros came from back here, the city-owned Church Ditch Canal. The process itself was actually really not that bad. I went on Twitter tweeted the city, they responded almost immediately. Um, and ironically today, actually, I got a response um, from the city. They said it would be about three business days and today's business day too. Contrast that with the almost 150 people in Denver who contacted the city about tree limbs down in the right of way. You know, the part of land between the curb and the sidewalk. City planted trees that you're responsible for. So if it feels like the city always wins, 
The answer is, you're right. Former Denver City Attorney Scott Martinez made it easy to understand why you are responsible for what you might think is the city's. Even if the city put the tree there in the first place, it's your tree now, it's your branch, it's your job to take care of that tree and make sure that it doesn't fall down on other people's property. And yeah, these are the same right of ways that sometimes require city approval to do things like this. In Cap Hill, many right of ways have been fenced off or given hostile architecture oftentimes to limit people from camping. Sometimes this requires city approval, sometimes not. So how come the city is involved in some of the right of way, just not when the tree falls? When we think about the law when it comes to things, the city, the government has the benefit of the doubt when it gets to regulate those things. When it comes to people and their behaviors, the people get the benefit of the doubt. There are some permits required, like if you want to do some nice landscaping under the trees or like we saw in the story, the temporary fencing in some cases, it's supposed to require approval from the city. But inside that area with the trees and the broken limbs, don't bother the city. It's all on you. Good to know. Not necessarily the answer people want, but it's the answer that you researched for them today. Marshall, thank you. Food benefits for families are being delayed again. Second time in six months. We look at options for families in need while we wait for the city to get its act together. Next. SNAP's broken again. Second time in six months, SNAP food benefits in Denver are delayed because of staffing shortages at Denver Human Services. The department had similar issues we reported on end of last year. The city insists that it's made improvements in benefit processing since then, but they still have delays. They're getting delays in getting SNAP benefits out to existing recipients. Their Family and Adult Assistance Division is responsible for processing the eligibility applications. That division's seen an increase in both new and existing applications, and they simply do not have the staff, they say, to process them. Since January, the city reports a 17% increase in new applications over the same time last year, 20% increase in SNAP recertifications. In December, they had 70 job vacancies. They filled 40 of those positions, but those people have to get trained before they can get to work. So DHS has been temporarily reassigning other trained staff to work overtime and try to speed up processing. In the meantime, DHS says it can expedite critical risk cases. So people facing eviction, older adults, people with medical emergencies. If you think you qualify for the expedited assistance, DHS asks that you call the number on the screen, 720-944-4347. DHS says it's working with Food Bank of the Rockies to put together monthly food pantries. That won't happen, though, for a couple of weeks. First one's on June 17th, then another on June 27th. We reached out to the nonprofit African Community Center in Denver. They help community members submit renewals for food stamps for SNAP. And you, you've helped uh, the African Community Center through your Word of Thanks microgiving campaign in the past. That nonprofit told us the backlog has impacted at least nine of their families, and they expect that number to increase next month. They're using some donated funds to help those families. At this point, though, they're not able to provide the full allotment that they typically get through SNAP. Cloudy and cool today with afternoon temperatures 20 degrees cooler than average in the lower 50s. These numbers are going to trend the other direction tomorrow. We'll go with sunshine and 70s as our latest storm system spinning in east central Colorado brings rain and snow to the continental divide, a few scattered showers to Denver, and then the whole system is going to move out later on tonight. Winter weather and travel advisories are in effect for the foothills for another inch or two of snow. As this system rolls out and skies clear, well, we're going to have chilly low in the 30s tonight. But look at your forecast for tomorrow. Sunny in 71, low 80s Thursday, close to 90 Friday, and maybe a late day thunderstorm over the holiday weekend, both Sunday afternoon and Monday as well. A lot of roof work in Denver lately. It's companies trying to comply with environmental legislation. This is a way to incorporate essentially a farm in a city. Our first up close look at the process of building a green roof next. We have now learned that at least 21 people have died at the elementary school shooting in Uvalde, Texas. The state's Department of Public Safety says 18 of those killed are students and three are adults. President Biden is expected to speak any moment now. He was expected to speak at 615 our time. The latest that we're hearing from the White House is that it will be 630. You will see that live here. 
when the president steps to the podium. If you could fly over the city of Denver, things would be getting greener. In the five years since Denver voters passed the Green Roof Initiative, 150 buildings have applied for a permit to build a more environmentally friendly roof. That's now required for buildings in the city with more than 25,000 square feet. So this could mean planting green space on the roof, installing solar panels, and new builds have to follow the same guidelines. Today, we finally got a chance to see exactly how this works when the folks at the CSU Spur near the National Western Center invited us to see their installation. This is a way to incorporate essentially a farm in a city. I think it is the future. We are on the fourth floor at the new Colorado State University Spur campus. Right now, I'm installing one of three research projects for this research green roof area. So green roof is literally a vegetated rooftop. So it can take a lot of different forms. So these green roofs are meant for veg crops, flowering plants. One of the reasons that Colorado State University invested in this work has to do with um, the fact that we have the green building ordinance in Denver. Some people may recall that in 2017, there was an initiative, initiative on the ballot that asked people to support green roof spaces going into new construction. So this is our medicinal plants plot. For large commercial spaces and residential um, new construction over five stories, um, it's a requirement now in the city of Denver that they need to have green roof spaces. We have plants like chamomile, anise hyssop. We also have lemongrass. We've just got to find ways to make our cities more livable. And while it might seem like an upfront cost, the benefits are long term and high value. Gardening in Colorado is eclectic, unique. It has its own flavor. And I think this is a way to add another dimension to all that's possible in gardening in Colorado. CSU Spur says their green roof initiative will be open to the public starting June 8th. They want to actually show people what a green roof is like and the benefits that it can bring rather than, you know, just being something kind of hidden up in the sky. You heard my thoughts about today's school shooting and the reasons behind it. Read some of yours in our feedback next. Stacks and stacks of feedback on what we talked about tonight. Evan Morris says that blaming today's shooting at the elementary school on guns is, quote, simply lazy. Can we talk about mental health? Yes, Evan, we can. We can talk about how America's mental illness rates are similar to other countries that do, don't have nearly as many mass shootings as we do. Trenton Mendoza says, Kyle, I think we need to start by getting rid of very violent movies. We could try that, but we could also look at all the countries around the world that consume American media like movies that don't have nearly the rate of mass shootings that we do. Elizabeth Suarez writes in to say it took cojones to make the statements you did. I don't think so. It just took the ability to read research and talk about what it says and to avoid the common dis uh, distractions that get thrown out to prevent us from talking about guns. Suzanne says you're wrong about guns being mostly used to commit suicide in Colorado. I want to know where your facts are coming from. Uh, they're coming from the Colorado uh, Department of Health and Environment, which tracks why people die in Colorado. Karen Lee says, my daughter just asked me if kids stop growing when they die. I told her no. See you next time.